Okay, good, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Wen. I'm from uh, Texas, and uh, we have today uh, Dr. Uh, Zajcek from uh, the University of Nebraska. Um, you know, she has basically uh, been at University of Nebraska from the days of medical school, uh, did her uh, medical school there, and then uh, her training afterwards as well, uh, her internship in internal medicine, and her residency and uh, fellowship. And so uh, University of Nebraska is uh, lucky to have her. Um, she's uh, very talented, able to do both the musculoskeletal radiology and breast imaging. Um, that's kind of a, a rare combo. So, um, you know, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Zajcek today and thank her for her time. Uh, and so good morning to you all around the world. Um, this is uh, definitely a great uh, gathering. Um, so um, I'll let Dr. Zajcek go ahead and start. And what I'll say is, um, you know, for questions, go ahead and uh, put them in the you know, Q&A or chat box. And uh, Dr. Zajcek will answer them all at the end. I'll be moderating and uh, reading those questions uh, at the end of the lecture today, OK? Um, I'll let Dr. Zajcek take over, and uh, I'll put myself on, on mute. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh... Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I am, I am uh, from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I am uh, assistant professor of um, radiology in the sections of breast and musculoskeletal imaging. And today we're gonna be uh, talking about imaging of bone and joint infections. So we'll get started. Uh, the, le the lecture is set up in, um, sort of a case-based format. So we're gonna go through some cases uh, and, and talk about uh, the findings that we see. And, and so let's get started. So our first case is a 79-year-old male with pain uh, in his knee. You can see here that we have an AP and a lateral radiograph of the left knee. What you'll notice is that there is a uh, calcification within the joint consistent with chondrocalcinosis. Um, there are also some mild degenerative changes, but the biggest finding is a, a large joint effusion. And the, the clinicians in this case were suspicious enough and went on to get uh, an MRI now, if you're concerned about, and since we're talking about bone and joint infections, a joint effusion with concern for infection is enough to get you to consider uh, pulling fluid or uh, doing an arthrocentesis, um, but they went on to get an MRI in this case. And you can see on the MRI that there is a joint effusion uh, image on the left is a T1 weighted sequence. Image on the right is a fluid sensitive sequence. Uh, so you can see the, the high T2 signal intensity uh, on the right from the joint effusion. And you'll notice on the left that the synovium is actually brighter than the, the joint fluid itself. And there is also extensive associated soft tissue edema uh, posterior to the knee here. A couple more selected uh, images from the exam demonstrate a, that joint effusion with synovial enhancement. And there's also sort of patchy marrow edema-like change. Um, and in this scenario, that could be changes of potentially early osteomyelitis or it could be reactive. And it's a little bit hard to tell without the T1 uh, correlation in this case, but it just demonstrates some of the findings that you might see. Um, so this is a case of septic arthritis. A septic joint must always be considered in a monoarticular inflammatory process. Predisposing factors include diabetes, steroids, intravenous drug use, or other debilitating diseases. Uh, radiographic findings and CT findings, uh, typically the earliest uh, finding is a joint effusion. The associated hyperemia that you get in the infectious process can cause periarticular osteopenia. We didn't particularly see that in this case. Um, uh, later in the process, you can see joint space narrowing due to cartilage destruction. 
uh, and again later indistinct cortical bone subchondral destruction marginal erosion that go along with uh, extension of that infection into the, the bone structure uh, as we saw in the MRI findings include initially joint effusions and synovitis that synovitis can be higher than uh, as we talked about higher than the joint fluid on the T1 sequences and the synovium enhances there's also uh, later again low T1 high T2 signal with contrast enhancement within the subchondral bone on both sides of the joint and that would be again indicative of extension into the bone structure with osteomyelitis um, and as we said similar to radiograph and CT later you're going to get joint space narrowing and erosions So the most common cause of septic arthritis is um, pyogenic. Uh, and this would be uh, organisms such as Staph aureus and Neisseria. Uh, any joint um, can be affected. Uh, if it's an unusual joint, such as the spine, the sacroiliac joints, the sternoclavicular joints, big cromioclavicular joints, think about intravenous drug use. Um, and typically with a pyogenic infection, you're gonna get rapid joint destruction. Um, tubercula, tuberculosis can also cause a septic arthritis. Um, that is typically a more chronic indolent process. Less um, osseous reaction is seen with a tuberculous septic arthritis. Um, often this is hard to distinguish from a, an inflammatory arthritis such as rheumatoid. Um, although a distinguishing factor, factor would be that tuberculosis is typically monoarticular versus an inflammatory process, such as rheumatoid arthritis, is usually polyarticular. Predisposing factors, again, to tuberculous infections include trauma, alcoholism, intravenous drug use, other systemic illnesses or steroid injections. Large joints are more common. And any other fungal infection acts similarly to a tuberculous infection as a chronic sort of indolent process. Another cause uh, is Lyme disease. This is tick-borne um, caused by the spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi. Its typical course is the skin lesion followed by flu-like symptoms. And then weeks to months later, you get a chronic arthritis. Um, early, again, you get the joint effusion, Later, you might get edematous changes in the fat pads around the knee with hypertrophic synovium. All right, our next case is a 52-year-old male. The clinical indication is a soft tissue ulcer. You can see here that he's got, or this, yes, it's a male, this person has, uh, Evidence of a prior amputation, you'll notice he doesn't have any digits, um, but he has a soft tissue ulceration here at the stump of, of his amputation site, um, extending from the stump, uh, from the soft tissue ulcer is a tract extending from the skin surface to the bone surface with intervening high T2 signal um, this image on the top is a T2 fluid weighted sequence. On the right hand side is a T1 weighted image, and the post contrast image is below. As I said, there's fluid signal extending to the bone surface with peripheral enhancement of that fluid. This would be concerning for a sinus tract and an abscess. You'll notice with similar to septic arthritis. Other immunosuppressed individuals, steroids. MRI allows for earlier detection. MRI is more sensitive, but is not specific. That T2 signal within the bone may be reactive or infectious. 
if the T2 signal is normal, you can be sure that it is not osteomyelitis. Um, and the classic finding is geographic low T1 signal with associated high T2 signal. And if you're able to give contrast, that's a bonus. There is contrast enhancement typically seen with osteomyelitis. The radiographic progression of osteomyelitis uh, can be varied and it depends on the origin of the infection. Uh, if the origin is hematogenous, um, typically the first week of the infection, the radiographs are gonna be normal. The next week you may get some demineralization, linear periosteal reaction, and finally you would end up with bone destruction versus an infection like we saw in the case presented where there's contiguous spread, there's a soft tissue injury that is connected to the bone. This presents with soft tissue swelling and cellulitis and moves centrally. So it hits next the periosteum and you'll get the periosteal reaction. Then you might get osteitis with infection of the cortical bone or, and then finally osteomyelitis. Again, the ultimate um, progression is later at almost two weeks where you'd get destruction or a lytic lesion of that bone. Um, in diabetics, which is what we typically see here, um, they, the infection is usually a result of a soft tissue injury uh, and rarely this osteomyelitis presents without an ulcer. Usually there is a soft tissue ulcer and begins as a cellulitis. Uh, infection can spread within anatomic compartments via tendon sheaths that are within or adjacent to those ulcerations. So again, as we mentioned, the routes of spread can be hematogenous where it's spread from the bloodstream from a remote site of infection, uh, whether it be gallbladder, urinary tract, uh, a, a wound in the skin. This route is more common in children. Uh, contiguous source, as we mentioned, typical in diabetics with soft tissue ulcers. Um, also other areas could be sinuses or teeth and you get direct spread into adjacent osseous structures. This uh, route of spread is more common in adults. Uh, again, direct implantation from some sort of penetrating or puncture wound or a surgery. That would be an, another version of contiguous spread. Uh, in adults, infection can occur anywhere. Typically in children and in infants, these are going to be metaphyseal infections uh, due to a separate blood supply to the metaphysis. The arteries at the metaphysis in children are very tortuous and turn sharply and can have sluggish flow. So they're prone to thrombosis during transient bacteremia, which allows infection to set up in those locations more uh, easily than anywhere else in the, in the bone structures. Again, um, pyogenic is common. Um, we sort of talked about these things with the radiographic progression. Um, again, it takes a couple of weeks where you're going before you're going to see findings on x-ray, which is why the MRI is more sensitive. You can see findings earlier than you can by radiograph. Um, subacute infection, you can get what's called a Brody's abscess, which is a subacute localized form of osteomyelitis. Again, this is commonly staph aureus. Um, this can be metaphyseal, but it can also cross the growth plate. And then there can also be chronic hygienic osteomyelitis where you develop uh, a sequestrum, which is a small uh, devascularized uh, fragment of bone, basically a floating piece of bone. They get surrounded by a thick periosteal new bone formation, which is called the involucrum. And you may or may not get a cloaca, which is an opening within that thick periosteal reaction, which allows the drainage of pus into the surrounding soft tissues. And you may or may not get a sinus crack to the skin surface. Uh, 
Similar to septic arthritis, the non-pyogenic uh, infections have a slower course. There's less host reaction. Common organisms include tuberculosis, other fungal infections, uh, syphilis, uh, and then there's a variety of other causes or organisms with Lyme, parasitic infections, leprosy, um, which can cause an osteomyelitis. All right. So our next case is a seven-year-old female with pain and fever. And you will notice in this that the, so again, pediatric patient, so not skeletally mature, there's an open physis. Um, there's lateral soft tissue swelling over the fibula, but really no osseous findings in this case. This patient went on to have an MRI. And the first thing you'll notice is irregular low signal intensity on the T1 image on the left with sort of heterogeneous increased T2 signal on the image on the right. There is also a subperiosteal fluid collection and a joint effusion. Another selected image uh, from the post-contrast sequence uh, gives us a, a, another look at the tibia and the fibula with that periosteal, subperiosteal fluid collection. And this time you'll notice that it's enhancing. There's internal areas within that fluid collection which are not enhancing, which is just the fluid. Um, so this is a case of pediatric osteomyelitis with the narrow signal abnormality that we talked about here, a subperiosteal abscess, and an associated septic joint. So pediatric osteomyelitis typically presents with pain, fever, uh, the child not wanting to bear weight. Again, as we mentioned, the metaphysis of the long bone is most common due to hematogenous seeding. Staph aureus is the most common organism. Again, in radiographs, the earliest finding that we're going to see is soft tissue swelling. Later, we are going to get osteopenia, periosteal reaction, and finally bone destruction. And then on MRI, we're going to see low T1 signal, high T2 signal with associated contrast enhancement if contrast is given. There are going to be ill-defined tissue planes surrounding soft tissue, uh, edema and infection, and abscess is common, including intraosseous, subperiosteal, and soft tissue locations, as we saw in that case. Okay, switching gears a little bit. This is a 51-year-old male with cellulitis. The clinical question in this case was, does this patient have septic arthritis? Now I'm showing you two selected CT images. Uh, you can see that this is, this is a lower extremity. Um, this is the tibia and the fibula, and this is up in the location of the femur. Just have to take my word for that. Um, but I'm not showing you the knee joint because it was normal. So the patient does not have septic arthritis. But what they do have, you'll notice, is gas within the soft tissues of the lower extremity. There's also fluid in the intermuscular septa, as well as low density within the muscles itself, which is very suspicious for an abscess. In the lower portion of the leg, Actually, in both the upper and the lower portions of the leg, you can see subcutaneous edema. The intra and intermuscular edema is a little bit less, more, less defined within the lower portion of the leg here, but you can see areas of low density within the muscles, in between the muscles, and definitely within the subcutaneous tissues. 
So this case with the soft tissue gas, the perifascial fluid, the intramuscular abscesses, this was concerning for necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, this is a rapidly progressive infection with extensive necrosis of the subcutaneous tissues and fascia. It's usually associated with severe systemic toxicity. And this is a clinical diagnosis. Um, this often doesn't get imaged. In fact, um, if they're concerned about this, this typically goes straight to the operating room for debridement. Um, however, when it is imaged, you can see soft tissue gas tracking along the fascial planes, fascial fluid um, and thickening. On MRI, which I didn't show you here, you would see high T2 signal uh, or the fluid um, between the muscles and along the deep fascial planes. You can have intramuscular edema. Um, contrast enhanced images are not necessary. They would help you see um, intramuscular and other soft tissue abscess or areas of non-enhancement, which would suggest necrotic tissue. Um, but muscle pyomyositis or actual infection within the muscle does not exclude a diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis. Um, again, the treatment is early surgical intervention with fasciotomy and debridement. And again, as I mentioned, if there's a high clinical suspicion, regardless of the imaging findings, um, surgery is necessary. All right, next case, we have a 15 year old male with pain. We have frontal and, and lateral radiographs of the distal right femur. You will notice that there is a thickened cortex and it may or may not project well, but there are small areas of lucency or lytic lesions within the medullary space of the distal femur. On the lateral view, you can, it's very subtle, but there's a little cortical defect on the anterior margin of the distal femur. And you may also notice some increased density within the central portion of that medullary space. Here's a corresponding MRI. First thing you'll notice on the T1 sequence uh, where the arrow is pointing is the thickened uh, cortex. And uh, solid periosteal knee bone. There's also a low signal intensity structure within the medullary space, which corresponds to that intramedullary density on the radiograph. You will also notice on the post contrast image that there is a significant enhancement within the medullary space surrounding that low signal intensity structure. There's an opening in the cortex, which corresponds to that small cortical defect on the anterior margin of the distal femur. And that enhancement is pouring out into the adjacent soft tissues. Selected sequences aren't always great, but this is all connected. And there's soft tissue peripheral enhancement here. So this is um, your classic chronic osteomyelitis with this thickened cortex, a sequestrum, the involucrum with the thickened bones surrounding that sequestrum, and the cloaca with the opening into the adjacent soft tissues with the intramedullary abscess extending into the adjacent vastus intermediate and vastus intermedialis musculature and the adjacent soft tissues and fascia. So this is chronic osteomyelitis with thickened irregular sclerotic bone. Um, there's periosteal bone formation in the solid pattern. Um, there's soft tissue swelling. There is a sequestrum in this case, not always, but in this case there is. Uh, MRI findings include the marrow and the soft tissue edema, abscess and sinus tracts, all of which we saw in this last case. Um, the differential diagnosis uh, includes neoplasm, especially acutely 
um, osteomyelitis and, 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 intra and intraosseous abscess can mimic a Ewing sarcoma or a longer Hans cell through steatocytosis in um, the appropriate age group. Uh, risk factors for chronic osteomyelitis, like many of our infections, include diabetes, uh, dialysis, intravenous drug use, poor nutrition, cigarette smoking, or prior trauma to a bone. Treatment typically includes surgical debridement, intravenous antibiotics. Um, oftentimes they will do surgery and place hardware that's impregnated with antibiotics uh, and potentially in, in severe cases, amputation may be the only form of treatment. Very rarely, you can develop a squamous cell carcinoma due to metaplasia within that sinus tract after, after long-standing chronic infection. All right. So our next case is a 40-year-old male with bilateral hip pain. You'll notice I've given um, two coronal MRI images. Uh, image on the left is a T1-weighted image. Image on the right is a fluid-sensitive sequence. I believe it's a stir. And you'll notice that this patient has this placentic linear low T1 signal abnormality in both femoral heads. Actually, I'm pointing to the one on the patient's left. There is corresponding high T2 signal within that abnormality. And this is consistent with avascular necrosis of both femoral heads. You'll notice that the patient also has joint effusions and there's some mild intramuscular edema within the pelvic adductors, which is demonstrated here on this axial fluid sequence, fluid sensitive sequence. You can see the joint effusions and the intramuscular edema within the pelvic adductors. Now, this is a very non specific finding. Uh, MRI in general is sensitive for finding signal and uh, abnormalities. Um, but not always very specific. So intramuscular edema could signal um, muscle strains. Uh, it could be reactive to the adjacent um, joint infusions, or potentially it could be related to an infectious or an inflammatory myositis. And there's really no way to know without a clinical picture. This patient came back one month later, and you'll notice that there's been dramatic change. And I'm going to circle one of the joints, um, but they're both have both joints have this similar findings. So this is the image on the left is a fluid sensitive sequence, and the image on the right is a contrast enhanced T1 image with fat saturation you'll notice that there's complete destruction of the joint space. There's enhancing uh, joint fluid. There's narrow edema on both sides of the joint into the acetabulum and the femoral uh, proximal femur with associated contrast enhancement. Um, so this is now progressed to a septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. And here's an axial image. So it, similar to what we saw before, this is post contrast. So these enhancing joint effusions where we can, and we can see the osteomyelitis. There's also intramuscular abscesses. So these are, this is post contrast enhanced images. So this is enhancing soft tissue around fluid uh, in the pelvic adductors. So all of that non specific intramuscular edema we saw, we before was actually an, uh, a septic joint and probably infectious myositis that has significantly progressed over the past month. Pointing to those soft tissue abscesses. So soft tissue infections are usually a result of direct inoculation. 
that can be the result of systemic or hematogenous spread. Cellulitis is an infection in the subcutaneous tissues. Gas gang gangrene can result in soft tissue infection by gas forming organisms. Myositis, as we mentioned, can cause diffuse or focal edema within the muscle. MRI is most sensitive and the gold standard for assessing for soft tissue infection. And that myositis can progress to intramuscular abscess as we saw in this last case. Um, an abscess is a region of decreased T1, and increased T2 signal, which is fluid with peripheral contrast enhancement, which was demonstrated in that last case. So if we're talking about infection, there are a few notable mimics that should be um, mentioned. So our next case is a 40 something year old male with pain and swelling. I've got a frontal and a lateral radiograph of the right foot. You'll notice that there's malalignment in the talonavicular joint, the, uh, the navicular bone is displaced, uh, dislocated from its normal location. Um, you'll also notice that there's marked soft tissue swelling of the dorsal foot and ankle. This patient went on to have MRI. I'm showing you three selected images from the MRI. The top is a T1 weighted image. The bottom is a fluid sensitive sequence. And the image on the right is a post contrast image. So I'm going to draw your attention to the midfoot. Uh, the malalignment that we saw is not as well demonstrated on this single image, um, but you'll notice that there is low T1 marrow signal throughout the midfoot, particularly in the cuboid and the cuneiforms. There's associated edema and contrast enhancement. Now, if you'll recall, we talked about that constellation of signal abnormality when we were discussing osteomyelitis. Um, and that is true. However, this person with the malalignment, and in this case, the patient did not have an overlying soft tissue wound. So this is actually a case of a neuropathic or a Charcot neuroarthropathy. So typically we talk about the five Ds. So in this, in neuropathic arthropathy, there's normal bone density. You get joint destruction. You can have bony debris, disorganization, and dislocation. So very difficult to distinguish on the basis of imaging whether this is a Charcot neuroarthropathic joint versus a case of osteomyelitis with extensive destruction. The distinguishing features uh, that we have to rely on, uh, especially in the patient population, which is usually diabetic, is neuropathic arthropathy is typically unrelated to an ulcer. If there is an adjacent ulcer or a sinus tract and the abnormality is at a pressure point, then most certainly what we're looking at is an osteomyelitis. Um, if there is not an ulcer, then there's a high likelihood that we could be dealing with a neuropathic joint. Um, ne neuropathic arthropathy always involves a joint. Commonly it's the tarsal and metatarsal joints in the midfoot. Um, fracture lines can be common with a, ne a neuropathic arthropathy. And again, as we talked about, there's low signal intensity on T1, uh, high on T2 uh, with joint effusion. You can have periosteal reaction and destruction, and it's impossible to distinguish osteomyelitis superimposed on a neuropathic foot in general. You really need that overlying soft tissue ulcer to help you, the clinical picture to help you decide whether this person has a infection, an infection on top of their neuropathic joint. Here's a little chart that I find helpful. 
um, osteomyelitis, again, is adjacent to ulcer, ulcers at pressure points, typically the metatarsal 10, the calcaneal tuberosity, the distal phalanges, the malleoli at the ankle um, at pressure points, and there may or may not be joint involvement versus a neuropathic joint, which always involves the joints, the Liz Frank, midfoot articulations, calcaneal cuboid and talonavicular joints are very, very common. Ankle and subtalar are less so, but also common. Um, features for osteomyelitis, the cortical destruction, you can have a sequestrum or an intraosseous abscess, and you're not gonna find those things with a neuropathic joint. You will get bone fragmentation and malalignment. Um, and then both osteomyelitis and neuropathic joints get joint effusions, soft tissue edema, bone marrow edema, and periosteal reaction. So the normal things that you think of when you're thinking of an infection don't always help you distinguish one from the other. Next case is a 64-year-old female with joint pain. We'll note that this image was taken in March of 2012. Um, You'll see that the joint space is narrowed. We have some osteophyte formation. So we have some degenerative changes at the squenohumeral joint. Now, less than two years later, in September 2014, we have progression of the degenerative changes. We've got complete loss of joint space, osteophytes, the glenoid and the humeral head have been remodeled. So we have fairly rapid progression of degenerative changes in this patient. So when we see rapid progression of degenerative disease, you wanna always think about infection as a potential cause. And this person went on to have a CT scan of this shoulder and you'll see here that there is a large bursal fluid collection, this low density fluid within the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. The CT also nicely demonstrates the advanced degenerative changes um, with the complete joint space loss, the remodeling, we have subchondral cystic changes and osteophytes. And I'm gonna draw your attention to this coronal slice from the CT scan. You can see this ill-defined density layering within the joint fluid. You can also see it on the axial image here in the subscapularis recess. So, with, with the finding of the mineralization within the bursal and joint fluid, there's calcification in that fluid. And it should make you think of an entity called hydroxyapatite deposition disease. Typically, this is periarticular, commonly seen with calcific tendinosis, uh, where you get amorphous calcification uh, associated with a tendon or a bursa. The shoulder is very, very common. The rotator cuff musculature, such as the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Next most common is the hip ex external rotators, the gluteus medius and minimus muscles and tendons. Um, when hydroxyapatite is deposited in the joint, these crystals can cause joint destruction. And this is Milwaukee shoulder, uh, as it's also known, uh, where you get rapid joint destruction related to the crystal deposition rather than an infectious process or idiopathic, rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. Um, the association with complete rotator cuff tears, osteoarthritic changes, a non-inflammatory joint effusion containing crystals, you get synovial hyperplasia, cartilage destruction, and you can get destruction of subchondral bone and articular bodies. And again, this presents as a rapidly progressive destructive arthritis and we want to exclude infection in those cases. 
Next case is a four-year-old female with pain. We have just a single AP radiograph of the pelvis. You'll notice the asymmetry between the femoral heads. There is the epiphysis of the left proximal femur is much smaller and more dense than that of the one on the right. There's also some fragmentation and demineralization on the metaphyseal side of that physis. So this is um, actually uh, like half herpes disease. So it's idiopathic avascular necrosis of the femoral epiphysis in children, and it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So this patient may present similar to, similarly to that patient that had the septic um, ankle and osteomyelitis, where they have atraumatic pain, they don't want to bear weight, uh, they might have a joint effusion on their imaging findings. Um, but what you end up finding is the asymmetric femoral epiphysis, as we mentioned, the increased density at the epiphysis, the lucency of the proximal metaphysis, and the later you're going to get fragmentation of that femoral head, and very late in the disease process, you will end up with femoral head deformity, widening and flattening, and toxomagna deformity, and I'm going to show you that here, progression. So these are follow-up images of this patient at one, four, and nine years later. So this is one year after that first radiograph. You can see that the left femoral head is increasingly fragmented. Um, it's actually now happening on the right proximal femur as well. At four years, you can see that it's flattened and deformed, doesn't have the normal spherical shape of the femoral head. And at nine years later, this patient has nearly fused their, uh, is nearly skeletally, skeletally mature. They've almost fused all their physes, um, but you can see the flattened, widened uh, appearance of both femoral heads in this patient with like half herpes disease. All right, and our final case is a 37-year-old female with hip pain. And the question is, do they have septic arthritis or avascular necrosis? And I've provided a T1-weighted sequence coronal image of an MRI. And if you'll remember back what AVN looked like on that previous patient, the, the femoral heads in this patient are totally normal. There's no signal abnormality on the T1 weighted images. Um, I didn't provide you a T2 image in this case, but there's not much of a joint effusion. So our suspicion for septic arthritis is very low. They do not have avascular necrosis. You might notice uh, the some asymmetry adjacent to the iliac bones. The iliacus muscles are asymmetric from side to side here. And what could this be? So here we have axial CT, or I'm sorry, axial MR images. Again, T1, T2, and post contrast images. You'll see that there is a heterogeneous collection centered in, within the right iliacus muscle. This patient in a supine position can see a fluid level. There's increased T1 signal within this collection, and T1 increased signal has a differential on MR imaging, um, blood products, proteinaceous material, um, the post-contrast images. There's not much associated contrast enhancement. This is T1 signal that's shining through on these post-contrast images. I'll circle it for you here. There's that fluid level. So this is an intramuscular hematoma. It's a well-defined collection with variable signal characteristics depending on the age of the hemorrhage. Um, there's a, a very well 
researched uh, sequence and uh, the signal characteristics within the brain. Time course is a bit different in muscle, but this just is, is talking about whether they are ISO intense on T1 and bright on T2, ISO intense versus dark. So this is the brain sequence, but generally what we're talking about in intramuscular hematoma is just fluid that is a varying signal because it's uh, blood breaking down and blood breaking down has different ferromagnetic properties within the magnet on MRI. So these are mass-like, they're often heterogeneous due to repetitive bleeding. Um, what we wanna make sure is that that the patient didn't hemorrhage into a tumor. So we wanna make sure that these resolve, but they can be a mimic, a cause of pain, cause uh, somebody to have trouble walking and um, uh, a mimic of a soft tissue abscess. And the, the hallmark is really the varying uh, signal characteristics within hemorrhage versus a soft tissue abscess. And that is all I had. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, Dr. Zajcek, so I'm gonna read off uh, some questions, but it looks like the question that I see has already been answered. Uh, it was, the question was, how can we differentiate charcoal joint from chronic septic arthritis radiologically? And then the follow-up was typed, now I see my question is answered, so I believe you already answered that. Okay. And um, you know, also in the chat box, just there's just a lot of thank yous uh, from everyone. Um, you know, excellent presentation and uh, just an appreciation for uh, your talk from all over, um, from Rwanda, London, Zambia, and Nigeria. So, um, wow, thank you so much. From all over the world. Any anyone uh, with questions, uh, go feel free to uh, you know type into the Q and A box or chat box, and I will uh, read them out to uh, Dr. Zaychek. Another uh, hello from the Philippines. So um, from all over the world, this is great. Uh, yeah, thank this you. is amazing. All right. Another thank you. So looks like uh, the presentation was very clear. Um, uh, okay. Another thank you from Kenya. Um, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, they, just a lot of thank yous rushing, rushing in, uh, in the chat box here. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Zaitcher. Here's one uh, excellent information. Chronic osteomyelitis is a torment for the patient, especially in open lesions, since it will possibly never be cured despite multiple treatments. Antibiotics, use of uh, scarification technique, use of ozone, surgical scrubs, etc. The image plays an important role in guiding the treating physician in the evolution of the injury. Thank you very much. Uh, and that's from... Uh, General Hospital in, in, in Mexico. Oh, wow. Thank you. So uh, another thank you. Thank you for your lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Zajcek. It was a very clear lecture. The ABCs of bone and joint radiology. So, so it looks like, yeah, it was a very clear lecture and there's not like, there's no questions, but just an appreciation. Another thank you uh, for the lecture. Um, so excellent lecture. Congratulations. Uh, greetings from Mexico. So, all right, well, I'm, uh, you know, uh, saying thank you to everyone for joining uh, from around the world. Uh, we had 85 participants from all over the world. Uh, looks like uh, a lot of different continents. So thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you, everyone. And I'll let her uh, kind of uh, go ahead and say some words now. No, I just thank you all for joining in. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all and um, take care, everyone. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.